Well, good morning. So nice to uh, be with you on this wonderful, wonderful weekend that goes on through Tuesday and an extended weekend for a lot of people. And I hope you have good plans for just a lot of enjoyment as we celebrate the whole concept of freedom. Freedom in a nation that allows us so many liberties that many people never have experienced. So we're grateful to that, and uh, we are so thankful for July 4th, and we are so thankful that so many of our people are traveling all over the place and uh, enjoying themselves. Several of our staff are uh, off on vacations this week, and we're so glad for that, but we're glad you're here. You know, there's a statement that the cream always rises to the top. Okay, and so you're the cream there, you know, on the top, and you've come. You are here today, and we're glad that you're here, and I hope that we'll enjoy our time together. We're going to start a a five-week study today in a book that most people never read or study. It's so small, it's just one chapter, and it's hidden right at the end of the New Testament, just before the book of the Revelation. It's called the book of Jude. And we're going to start that study because what was written so long ago, 1950 years ago, is still as contemporary and current for us today as it was the day that it was written. That's the mystery and miracle of the Bible. This book that was written so long ago is so full of truth and truth never changes. And so truth applied then, truth applies today. So this letter was written sometime in the 70s AD. It was written to the Jewish believers in the new Jewish church, their new Christian church. And Jude, just chapter one, uh, is just one chapter long, but its brevity lets us know that there's something very important that it's got to say. Because they were having real strife in the church there at the time that this one chapter book was written, and it has a very important message. Let me show you some of the things that were going on within the church. False teachers had infiltrated the Christian community. And boy, when that happens, it starts causing all kinds of confusion and and crisis in the community. Secondly, Christians must stand firm in their faith and fight for the truth. And that's one of the big messages that you're going to hear in these weeks as we study the book of Jude, because we're in a battle today for truth. A third thing that we see is that we are told the way you fight for this is by remembering the teaching of the apostles. That means you've got to know the word of God. Because this Bible is what holds everything together. The truth sets us free. Also, by building each other up in the faith, the way we fight is by really standing together. And one of the joys of the church is for us to be brothers and sisters together in this thing called our Christian faith. And then third, by praying in the Holy Spirit. Nothing happens that glorifies God and furthers the kingdom of God without people who are praying for him to have his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then fourth, by keeping themselves in the love of God. That church was starting to have real struggles with all of that. And when that happens in a church, it can create all kinds of problems. So this is a strong series in a day where people prefer kind of softer and more gentle messages. This is a strong message. It's one we need to hear. So here's a little introduction to the book of Jude. The letter of Jude, or more accurately, Judah, according to the pronunciation of his name, both in Greek and in Hebrew. Judah was one of Jesus' four brothers who are named in the gospel accounts. None of the brothers followed Jesus as the Messiah before his death, but afterwards they saw him alive from the dead and then became his disciples. All these brothers of Jesus became leaders eventually in the first Jewish Christian communities, and Judah was known as a traveling teacher and missionary. And this gives us the background to understand the purpose of his letter. We don't know what specific church community he wrote to, but it was likely made up of mostly Messianic Jews. His writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, as well as other popular Jewish literature. 
Jude had become aware of a crisis facing this church, and so this helps us understand the letter's design. It begins with an opening charge, followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And then Judah closes by completing the charge about what this church is supposed to do. Judah begins by charging this church to contend for the true Christian faith. He says his plan was to write a longer work that explored our shared salvation through the Messiah. But that project, he says, got delayed when he heard the urgent news about this church, and so he fired off this very thoughtful but very short letter. Judah doesn't begin with how they're supposed to contend for the faith. Rather, he first goes into why. It's because of the corrupt teachers who have infiltrated this church. And it's not their teaching that he targets, but their way of life. Their moral compromise is what tells you they have bad theology. And so with that as our understanding of an introduction, let's pray and ask God to teach us some lessons today that will help us be more the people that he created us to be. Father, I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for the way you work in each of our lives to bring us together each weekend. And I just pray that you will speak to us today. If you do not speak, then we waste our time and we hear nothing that is of God. So that's why we're so dependent upon you. That's why we always pray to you and trust you and love you and believe in you. For you are the head of your church. You are the one that keeps us strong and, and true. And we pray that will always be what we experience here at Simple Church. Thank you for every person in this room. And I pray that you will now teach us some truth that will set us free this week. And as we pray for that, we also pray for our nation. We are so thankful for the country that you've allowed us to be living in today. And we thank you for the many blessings and freedoms that it offers to us. I pray that you will protect this nation and that you will, God, give us leadership that will lead us in your way, never away from truth, but always toward truth, which keeps us free, and that you will guide and direct our leaders. Your will be done, Lord. Your kingdom come. You raise up, you put down, you direct. We are trusting you for that for our nation on this July 4th week. We're so grateful for how good you've been to us. And we commit now this time to the working of your spirit to continue that direction in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. When we come to the first verse in this one chapter book, it says this. This letter, and it tells us who has written it. This letter is from Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ, and a brother of James. So Jude and James and others were the half-brothers of Jesus Christ. And James calls himself several things, and we'll look at those in a moment. But it's interesting that neither of these brothers believed in Christ while they were on earth with him. They were there, they saw him, they were raised up with him, they were in the same household together, they were at family gatherings together, but they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They didn't believe he would be the savior of the world until a magnificent thing happened. Not even at his death did they believe. Not even his burial did they believe. But at that resurrection, when they saw their half-brother, Jesus, raised from the dead, and then for 40 days ministered to over 500 people. And they saw the miracles and they saw the power. And then the Pentecost came and the Spirit of God came to represent Christ by living in our lives as believers. When the Spirit came, all of a sudden they believed so strongly that Jude went out and was one of the great missionaries of the faith, spreading the faith all over that area. And ultimately, he, along with others over a period of time, became a head of the church in Jerusalem. That's how the power of that resurrection of Jesus changed their lives, and they became believers. And so he's writing to this church that's struggling, but he starts out with encouragement. He says this, verse 1, I am writing to all who have been called by God the Father, who loves you and keeps you safe in the care of Jesus Christ. 
boy, there's a lot of encouragement there. He, he calls these people several names and, and uses several words to describe who they are. He starts off by saying who he was. He says, I am a slave. And a slave is a, a person who has a willing and total devotion to their master. I am committed to my master. And he tells us who his master was. He says, it is Jesus Christ. I am his slave, he said. And then he goes on and he says, I am called and we are called. And that word called means a personal act of God, our father, toward us, where he tells us we are several things. If you are a believer today, it's because God called you. I don't understand all of that. It's caused a lot of confusion in theological circles. And so we don't get into it too much because I think some of it's over our heads. But I do believe that God calls every person who is a believer in him. I also believe we have to respond to him in faith and how that all mixes together, we'll understand someday when we get to heaven. But he says, you are called, you believers. That's very special because that means everyone who is a believer in Christ and is a part of his church has a purpose and a design, a call upon their lives. In the Bible, it gives us several names that are given to us who are called. Two of those names are we're saints and we are holy. Let me show you what a saint or a holy person is. It's a person sanctified, made right in the sight of God, made pure in the sight of God. That's why we can be called saints and holy. If you know Christ as your savior, when he looks at you, he sees his son, Jesus Christ, Christ in me, the hope of glory. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. He sees Christ. And when he sees Christ, he says, you're a saint and you are holy. You and I can stand back and say, but you don't know what I said last week. You don't know what I did last week. You don't know what I thought last week. God says, yeah, I know. I know you're a human being. And, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But he says, I want you to know in my sight, because of the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary, and because of your faith in him and his gift of salvation to you through faith in him, you are in my sight, saints, you are holy, a person sanctified, a godly person, one known for piety and virtue. And if you and I as believers who say we're firm in our faith, if we stand back and say, I'm not sure there's so much piety or virtue in my life, then I would say you need to get before the Lord and get that taken care of. That's what he wants from us to be those kind of people. Someone who is set apart for God's special purposes. If you're called, you are a saint, you are holy, you are set apart for a purpose. I think we forget that sometimes as Christians. We just think salvation's about getting out of hell and getting into heaven. No, no, no. It's about living the life of Christ right here with all of his blessing and all of his design and all of his guidance on our lives. We are someone who are, we are set apart for God's special purposes. That's all who follow Jesus Christ. All who follow Christ are saints. Another word that is given to us by Jesus who are called is this, and it's such a great word. It's called friends. Friends. Um, he says in John 15, 15, I no longer call you slaves. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. He says, now you are my Friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. Jesus came to this earth and he gave the message of the Father to this world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he says, I've given you this message of truth. Therefore, I call you my friend. Don and I. Don Morris, who was a co-worker with me years ago, uh, he and I had a radio program for three years before we went to a television ministry. And 
And God uh, really used that. It was a little 15-minute thing with some songs and some inspirational thoughts and some prayers. And it was on at 10.30 every night after the news on radio in, in Grand Rapids area and in Michigan. And it's called the Friendship Hour. We brought it here to Des Moines for a year. And, uh, and it was just where we tried to tell people every night for 15 minutes, six nights a week, God loves you. He wants to be your friend. And to think of God, to think of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, being my friend, all of a sudden, man, that should cause us, cause you and cause me to love the Lord so very much because of who we are. We are friends. And then there's another name that Christ gave to us, and that is we are God's child. John 12 John 1, 12 through 13, he says, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God, a child of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, not because your mom and dad got together and decided to have you or hoped to have you, he said, it's a birth that comes from God. The minute we're saved, we become children of God. And what Jude is trying to do is to encourage this church, because this church was struggling. They were starting to fight amongst each other. There was false teaching starting to come in, and it was starting to cause all kinds of confusion and upset. Perhaps you've been in a church that once was happy and united and full of joy and love and family, and, and then all of a sudden it started to just have turmoil. It's like a, a virus that can come in. We try to guard against that so much here at this church. You don't ever want a virus of, of confusion or of, of a lack of love or a lack of acceptance or a, a lack of being willing to work together on things. We don't want that to ever happen. Welcome, folks. We're glad you're here. We don't want that to ever happen in this kind of ministry. And so he says, he says we have been called children of God. Now, why is all of this true? Why are we called and why, uh, why are we uh, children of God and why are we friends of Christ and why are we saints and holy? Well, he goes on and he says, it's because of who loves you. It's because of who loves me. You see, love isn't just one of God's attributes. It's his nature. It is God's nature to love. His love is uninfluenced. His love is freely given. And his love is uncaused. It's uninfluenced. It's not because of anything you or I do. He loves us. It's freely given. It's not because of anything that you and I are. He just gives it. It's uncaused. In other words, there's not a thing you can do to make God love you more than he loves you now. That's his nature. God is love. Our disobedient humanity should cause him to detest us. There is nothing in us to make God want to look on us with favor, except his nature. Uh, it always amazes me when Adam and Eve sinned against him. His, his holiness would have said, go to hell. And his love said, but there's got to be another way. And that other way was through the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. It's all because of his agape love. And that is love that is unmerited. It's gracious. It's constantly seeking the benefit of the ones he loves. I want you to know something. All week long, God's been after you. God's been before you and behind you. He's been all around you. He's been over you. He's been under you. And if you're a believer in Christ, he lives in you because he's always there wanting the best for you. It's our own 
willfulness, our own disobedience that brings any of the consequences of disobedience in our lives. But it's not because that is what God wants. God wants heaven's best for your life. And then we come to verse 2. So that's verse 1 of this little book. Verse 2 is so cool because he starts telling us what God wants for us. And he puts it this way. May God give you more and more. Not just more, more and more of three things that we really need. He says, may he give you more and more mercy, peace, and love. More and more mercy. Hmm. The Greek word is elios. More and more mercy. Mercy is a kindness or goodwill towards the miserable and afflicted joined with a desire to help them. And he's saying, hey, folks, I know. I know there's some stuff going on in the church that's starting to really hurt you and confuse you. It's starting to cause problems. Well, I want you to have more and more mercy, which is the kindness and goodness of God towards you when you're afflicted. And I want you to know he is there to join you and help you through this. I want you to have more and more mercy. But then he says, I want you to have more and more peace. More and more peace. And that's a reine. And, 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 and peace means the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And, and so when you're assured of your salvation through Christ, you fear nothing from God and you're content with its earthly lot, whatever it may be. We're content with where we are. And God says, I want more and more of that kind of peace for you because this turmoil can cause some unrest. I want you to keep your eyes on me. I want you to look at me because I got more and more peace for you. Peace in every situation because we trust in Christ. And if today you're struggling with something in your life, in your family, in your job, in your, in, in, in your situation, I just want you to know God wants mercy for you. He's right there to help you whatever your situation, and he wants you to have peace through that all. And that comes only by trusting in him. Look at the situation. It'll cause you all kinds of unrest. Look to God and that sense of peace, that sense of mercy will fill your heart. It'll help you through. It'll guide you through. It'll protect you through whatever you're facing. And then the final thing he says is, I want you to have more and more love. More and more love. That's that agape love. That's that, that heart of God love. It's love that is unmerited, gracious, and constantly seeking the benefit of the ones he loves. He says, I want you to know God always is wanting a benefit for you. Now, you got to understand, he's getting ready to let this church have it. And we're going to see that the next three weeks. See, he's got to deal with some really rough stuff. And what I love about God is before that happens, he wants us to always remember all this truth because life doesn't always work out the way we want it to. It isn't always a rose garden. And so he wants us to know that when you're going through some thorns, when you're going through a hard path, I want you to know this is truth more and more of God's love, of God's peace, God's mercy. I want that for you because that's going to get you through what we're going to learn about in the weeks to come. What a lot of churches today are going through, what our culture is going through. God says, I want you to have my mercy, my peace, my love, just in abundance, more and more and more of it through all of that. And then we come to verse 3. And in verse 3, Jude reveals the entire purpose of this letter. Why did he write this little short but powerful letter? He says this. He says, Dear friends, 
although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. In other words, he said, when I sat down to write this, I wanted to just tell you, boy, God's been so good and we're saved and we're called and we're saints and we're holy and we're friends and, and we're family and oh my goodness, it's so good. He said, I want to encourage you with that. But then I heard your problem. I heard your struggle. I heard that you're going through a crisis. So he said, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. He said, I had to change for my reason. Now, I've given you a little taste of it. He says just in the first couple of verses of this little letter. But now I've got to tell you, you're going, you're facing some stuff. And you're going to have to face it in the power of the Lord. So what we see, first of all, is he had a change of plans. He was compelled. Look at what the word compelled means. It's, it's a Greek word, ananke. Okay? And it, it basically reveals or reflects a danger or a distress, a sense of duty or obligation that must be met. He said, I was writing this, and all of a sudden, man, I sensed you got to hear another message from me even besides the one that I wanted to share because you got distress and I've got an obligation to share with you truth that can get you through it. So what is the issue? Well, we're going to start studying that next week. This is kind of an introduction to this book. And next week we're going to, to see a, uh, what this, this problem really is, but there's a clue at the end of verse three. And here's what it says. It says, I felt compelled to urge you to contend. That word contend means to fight or to battle for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. He said, I came to realize you've got a battle on your hands. And I felt compelled to tell you to take it seriously. And to contend, to be ready, to stand strong. That's why this isn't going to be, for the next few weeks, the softer, gentle message that I love to give. It's a pretty hard message. It's a pretty strong message that comes from the Word of God. And, and so there, there was a force in the church that was seeking to take down the faith that the people had once and for all believed in. And what he's saying is, step up, take responsibility, contend for the faith. Now, Jude is speaking to that church, but it's just as relevant for our church and for every church today. There are a lot of forces in our world that are seeking to push us away from truth. And the Bible is very clear. It is only truth that sets you free. We even have a move in our nation, I believe, to try to confuse us so much about truth that it comes to a point where we don't know if there is any truth. Or maybe it's your truth for you and your truth for you and my truth for me. Well, we need to understand some things. We are God's called and chosen people because of his mercy and grace. He's called us. If you're a believer in Christ, he's called us to stand for the faith. Number two, we are loved by God and we are kept saved by Jesus. It is Jesus who keeps us saved. It's not you or me who keep us saved. It is Christ in me, the hope of glory. It is the Holy Spirit living in us, representing Jesus Christ every day, who keeps us in the faith. The Bible says he seals us until the day of redemption. Jesus keeps us saved. But we too are called to contend for the faith and to stand against any false teachers in the church who are perverting the truth of God's word. And there's so much of that today. People are not hearing the truth. And so many churches are going off on things that are not biblically based or true. And we will see next week that there were false teachers in this church. And they're described as enemies 
ungodly, arrogant, ignorant, hypocrites, deceivers, grumblers, fault finders, causing division. Uh, this series gets uh, pretty intense and challenging because we're going to look at that. Now, there's a reason that I'm excited about sharing that along with Brandon with you in these next three weeks. And the reason is because right now, as far as I know, and pastors are sometimes the last to know, but as far as I know, there's a peace and a unity and a joy and a happiness and, 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 and a wholeness in our church right now. And we don't ever want to be proud of that because that's when you fall apart. We just want to thank God for his goodness and his grace and his unity and the love that he's brought to the people who are a part of this fellowship, this family. But I want you to know that can be lost so quickly. There are some people that can come in and they can start sowing wrong teaching or wrong attitudes, or they can start doing things behind people's back. It's happened over and over and over again in the church of Jesus Christ, and it could happen right here. And it's like a virus that just spreads. I've seen churches left and right fall apart because they allowed some of that to come in. We've had a few times where that's tried to come in here, and we've had to ask those dear, dear people whom God loves and we loved, we've had to ask them to leave because they're not allowed to infect this congregation. That's contending. I mean, I love the church, and I love La La Land, you know? I just love when everything's happy and peaceful and fun. But you also got to know, Satan hates the church of Jesus Christ. And he will do anything he can to get a root in, get a hand in some way, to destroy what God is trying to do in the lives of his called people. So we needed the encouragement we've received today about who we are in Christ. We're saints and holy and children of God, and we're in the family of God, and we're the friends of Christ. We needed all that. And I want to close with a word that popped into that scripture that is what we're going to talk about the next three weeks. And uh, it's the word contend, Okay. He says, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to you. God says, I entrusted my truth, my word, my love, my purpose. I entrusted it to you. Now you must contend, fight the battle for it. It's kind of the picture of a, a boxing match or a chariot race or a, a wrestling match. It's kind of those kind of words, which was actually connected to warfare. It's kind of like a picture of two men engaged in a struggle until one came out the victor. You watch wrestling matches, you watch cage fights, you, you watch this kind of stuff personally, which I kind of hate to watch cage fights to me. That's the most stupid. Uh, anyway, the thing is, I, I won't go there. I just decided not to go there. Okay. Uh, but the image in this, when we're contending, the image is of a person fighting, resisting, grabbing, bracing, attacking, out of breath, yet focused with as much perseverance as is needed to finish what's been started. And that's what Jude is talking about. And it kind of sounds silly right now here at Simple Church because really things are good. We're happy. The staff is happy. I think they like me. I love them. I, I just think we're happy. I also know how quickly that can change. If we aren't always observant of what God's wants of God's will, of God's word, and then watching so that that never ever is allowed in this place called simple church. And what Jude is going to show us is that we must be willing to contend for the faith that we have received from Christ 
and from his word. And my prayer is that we will always be a church that knows God's hand on us. And that he'll never have to lift that hand because we've turned our eyes and our heart and our attitudes away from him. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love each other with the same kind of love that drove Christ to the cross. That's God's will and plan for his church. And when we live that way, the world sees that and they say, oh my God, there's something to what they've got. Don't let anyone or anything ever rob this place of that kind of love of God and joy and peace of the Lord. Just like the church in Jude's day, we too live in a relativistic culture, culture that follows after many gods, a culture that's following after many truths, and it's confusing us. You can just sense the confusion. Uh, we're trying to hold this thing together with all kinds of money and all kinds of military and all kinds of rules and regulations and laws. And uh, we're trying to hold it together. But you can sense there's a lot of something wrong in our nation on this July 4th birthday week. And a big part of it is I think we've been turning away from the truth that sets us free. That's why we've got to continually know God's word and contend, stand strong for, even fight for the truth that God gives us in his word. May we be people, this is uh, God's desire for this church, people who care about the truth, and that's why we're taking a, 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 a five-week time to really go into and dive deep into a, a one book in the Bible, kind of do it verse by verse to get every piece that God was saying to that church because he's also saying it to us. Be a church that has a care about the truth. Be a church that clings to that truth, clings to it. Believe the truth. Believe it. Stick close to the Bible and stick close to Christ. As we do that, you watch what God can do through his people who are yielded to him. Don't miss next week as we continue to see what God wants for his people and how we have to stand strong sometimes to be able to realize that. Father, thank you so much for your word for the truth that you have given to us today. And I pray that in a special way, Lord, you will guide and direct our paths, that you will cause us to be men and women who are so blessed by the, the peace and the mercy and the love of God, but also who are so strong in our understanding of your truth that nothing nor no one can separate us from you. We dedicate all we've talked about today and been a part of, all that this lesson from Jude will teach us this month, we dedicate it to your honor and glory, to the protection of your church, to the blessing of your church, to the blessing of every person who calls you Father and you Christ Savior. We love you. We yield to you now. You are our King of kings. You are our Lord of lords. And we yield to your leading. Amen.